All right, welcome to Inside the Birds TV with Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan. And today, we're very thankful to have with us one of the premier personalities and reporters in the Philadelphia media, somebody who I had the great pleasure of working alongside for three years. I don't know if he feels that way, but he is a consummate <laughs> pro, Mr. Derek Gunn. What's going on, Gunner? It's been a long, too long. Hey, guys, uh, it's a pleasure to join you. And Jeff, I, I wouldn't admit this publicly, but yes, I did enjoy working with you and exchanging banter with you in the three years we worked together. Well, I've got well, some well, pretty well. good stories. <laughs> i got some good stories. Can you tell well, me? Well, well, can, 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 can we have one? Can we have one? Yeah, That's, I'll give you, you one right now. Yeah, okay. All right, so you learn but real quick. stories? Oh, I got stories. I got cards to pull. You learn very quickly when you work oh, alongside D Gun doing a TV spot, especially during Eagles pregame, that when the camera is off, Adam, and nothing's live or anything like that, you can't just stand around D Gun because that microphone becomes a little bit of a poke and a prod machine for him and the camera crew. And then there was our friend Jerry Hines and and uh, Tealman because you might unsuspectingly get hit with a ca with a microphone. If you're not protecting yourself around D gun, oh, I don't, I don't, wow. I don't remember anything. I admit to nothing publicly. Um, <laughs> you know what? And, and as that saying goes, let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> we'll do that. Well, it's great to have you. Um, we're going to get into the yep. Eagles with your D gun, uh, but also we're going to chop it up a little bit about your time at CSN yep. Philly slash NBC sports. I still call it CSN. It'll always be that to me, but um, yep. we're going to talk about what it's like for you to be a free agent for the first time in uh, more than two decades. So um, first, I just want to tell our listeners to download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code ITB for a special offer when you sign up. That's code ITB for a special offer when you sign up at DraftKings Sportsbook. D-Gun, how you been lately? I'm doing great, man. Um, it's been uh, a little bit more than two weeks uh, since I got the word. Um, as a matter of fact, as soon as I hung up the phone and, and, and got the notice that I would be laid off, I had a piece about it. Um, there was no anger, no animosity, no anxiousness, nothing. And that to me was confirmation that indeed maybe it's time to move on. Um, I've been doing this 41 years, man. Been covering yeah. football from San Diego to, to New York, from Florida to Minnesota. Um, and I can, I will continue to cover football in some capacity. Um, so, you know, when you think about people that don't have the opportunity to do what we do, and especially to have, be able to do it for as long as I've been able to do it, um, it, to me, it's been a blessing. So now I'm at a stage where what's the next challenge for me? What's the next obstacle? What's the next, next hurdle that I need to, to clear? And I'm excited about the prospects that are out there. Derek, most people who don't live in the Delaware Valley or the local Philadelphia area, yeah. I don't think people quite understand your connection with the players. And I, when I first started being a contributor to Comcast Sportsnet, yeah. that's where I really started in television, I didn't realize the connection that you have with players. Locally, we know with Brandon Graham, you guys have a great connection. But yeah. when you guys started in 1996 with Michael Barkan, D. Lynham, uh, the whole Pete Christie, for goodness sake. Uh, yep. Leslie Goodell, uh, Pat and, Boyle, and, yeah, Pat Neil Hartman. Wow. It was it was it was an incredible young group of, of reporters. How in the world did you start your connection with the players? Um, this started long before I, I came here, Adam. Um, and I co covered the Chargers, the Packers, mm. the Steelers, and now the Eagles. And the one constant that I always tried to maintain in my career was be forthcoming and honest with everybody. Uh, I can go to my grave saying I never dimed out a source in my life, whether it was a player front office personnel, a trainer, security people, whatever the case may be. And when you, when you maintain that consistency, word gets around. Because as you guys know, there's that fine line between trust and untrust when it comes to players and the media. Now, when you're in this market like Cincinnati or Buffalo or Green Bay, you have a handful of guys so the players get to know you a whole lot better. But when you're in the markets like New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and you got 50 to 75 micro microphones being thrust in your face and you come from a small town, even though you played a big college, you're a small town kid, it's overwhelming in a lot of ways. So when I got here and when we started in 1997, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a bunch of us that covered the Eagles. There was no one person that covered the Eagles. 
it was me, it was Pat Boyle, it was Bruce Casella, Ron Burke, mm -hmm. you know, at any given moment. After that initial year, Tom Stathakis and Jim Cudahy, who were also instrumental in starting uh, Comcast Sportsnet, came to me and said, hey, we want you to be the full-time Eagles reporter. We heard about your reputation before you got here in other cities. And I told them, I said, if you want me to do this, I'm not just going to do this for home games, which is what they wanted me to do. I have to do this home games, road games, practices, et cetera, et cetera. And they looked at me like, wow, that's like a bonus. We didn't expect you to say that. And that's how it began. So once it began, I had to become who I am, the gun. Um, what I do that a lot of people overlook is I do my homework. And I'm not talking about just learning about player stats. I want to know where he came from. I want to know what his home life was like. I want to know what his hobbies are. And a lot of times I'm able to break the ice with players because we might be from the same region, same city, like hunting, like fishing, music, same artist. And when you have that to connect with a player, it helps them to relax. And all of a sudden, when you get them to relax before you sit them down and it becomes interviewer and interviewee, it makes the, the interview that much more insightful and relaxed. And then all of a sudden off camera, they start talking, talking to you about stuff under your breath and they'll say, hey, don't repeat that. Now, I think that's like the test. They want to test you. And so I say, you know what? I got you. I'm not going to say anything. And the more you do that, the more they trust you. And the more they whisper to other players in the locker room. And the more they whisper to the trainers. And then all of a sudden, the coach, who, who are you talking about? And so it, it, it's carried on like that. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm proud of the one. The one aspect I'm really proud of is I've been able to connect not just with players, but a lot of people within organizations to get them to trust me. It's interesting, Gunnar, because you're unique in that regard for TV because not a lot of people are a reporter, an anchor, which you have done, an interviewer slash host, and an analyst, right? right. People tend to be um, pigeonholed into one or the other or the other. Were you, sure. is that something that you felt um, you grew into or did you come to Philly ready to be, wear all those hats and more? Came to Philly ready to be all that and then some. Because um, being an outsider, I, I'd heard all the horror stories about, you know, a newcomers coming to Philadelphia, how critical this market is, how passionate they are. You can't pull the wool over their eyes in Philadelphia. They know their sports history. They know their teams. So when we hit the ground running, I had to make sure I had my A game. And when I came into this market, there was a wealth of talent. You had Gary Papa here. You had Beasley Reese. Uh, you had Vice Sikahema. You had Ron Burke. So I had to have, I had to have my game on point. And because of what I had done preceding here in Pittsburgh, in Milwaukee, in San Diego, I was ready for the task. Um, I was excited about trying to win people over in this market. And I think over the course of 23 years, I was able to do that. Derek, you talked about all the markets that you were in. How yeah. does this fan base differ from those other markets? Um, in Green Bay, <laughs> no matter what happens, they love you no matter what. You had to get frustrated, disappointed, but not to this degree. Uh, I think this market is very similar to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a hardcore market. Uh, they love their Steelers. They bleed Steelers in that market. They know their football, just like Philadelphia. San Diego was such a transient market. Most people who went to Chargers games just did it because it was an outing for the weekend. They weren't true Chargers fans. So they weren't as critical of the team. But I think Pittsburgh thoroughly prepared me for what I was going to encounter uh, here in Philadelphia. When I got here in Philadelphia, obviously it was on a bigger scale because of more volume of people. But I think Pittsburgh, over the, the, the 10 years I was in Pittsburgh, really prepared me for when I came to this city. Derek, when I, when I was working there uh, alongside you from 2012 to 2015, yeah. one of the first things that I really like hit me on the first few days was that, you know, that was a time where they, the, ex, the website was expanding. So yeah. Tim Panaccio was working there. Jim Salisbury yes. was working there. D Lynham yeah. is covering the Sixers. Ruben Frank's yeah. doing the Eagles. You're there. Neil Hartman's there. John Borick's there. Al Morgant. I, I just couldn't believe like how much established talent was there and yep. it was almost humbling for me to even be yep. able to say I worked there along everybody and some names that, I, that I've missed. So I'm wondering, since you're an OG for that place, <laughs> if you ever OG. stop, OG, <laughs> you're original, right? OG. Man. Was there, was there ever a time that you looked around and went, man, we have built something amazing here, even more so than I ever thought when I came over here in 97. Yeah. You know what? Um, uh... Jeff, the thing is, when we all started this in 1997, 
you know, outside of Neil Hartman and Michael Barkan, who had worked in this market, uh, D. Lottom already has a notoriety because of who her dad was in this market. But a lot of us came from various parts of town. Pete Christie came in from Texas. Pat Boyle, you know, coming in from out of town. Casella was already here um, locally. Ron Burke had been here for years. Leslie came in from the West Coast. And we made the commitment. You know, first of all, Eagles were checked at the door. And I think that's one of the most phenomenal things about what we started. Eagles were checked at the door. We worked as a cohesive unit because we were the pioneers of this thing. It was on our shoulders to succeed or fail. And so two weeks, two to three weeks prior to the network actually launching on October 1st, we were out and about running around the city compiling as many stories as we possibly could so that we would have a quality uh, product as much as we could to launch the network with. And initially, we met some resistance from PR people in the city. They were like, who are you? Who the heck are you guys? You know. Hmm. And so we had to win them over. And slowly but surely, we won them over. And as we won them over, we became a cult with our daily news shows, our sports night shows, other talk formats, half hour, hour specials that we did when players would leave. And unfortunately, when, when, when certain players would die. You know, we had an incredible group. You know, see, we on camera get all the accolades but we had an incredible group of talented people behind the scene, producers, editors, assignment editors that nobody will ever know about. But those people are just as responsible for our success as we were in front of the camera. In a lot of ways, they made our jobs a lot easier because they did so much research. And then the thing grew and began to branch out. We began to add writers, the local writers to the show. We all of a sudden, we were starting to get prominent current and ex-athletes on our shows. And we gave that market something they had never seen before and we were so proud of the fact because it kept growing and kept growing until, of course, well, you know what happened over the last four years or so. So what brought you to Philly? Because you were in other markets. Was it just the, yeah. the, the challenge, the job? Or is it really, as you were discussing, the chance to begin with a new sports network was, quite frankly, as you said, and I totally agree, was yeah. groundbreaking. Yeah, um, I, I tell you, I, I came here with some resistance because um, I was out visiting my, my in-laws, fam- my wife's family family in California, when my agent called me and said, man, uh, you must be living right. He said, you've had three job offers in the last 24 hours. One was back in my hometown, Milwaukee. One was in Detroit in this place. And he said, Comcast Sports Network. I said, what's that? He said, it's a new startup regional sports network. I think you should really look into it. I said, I don't want to be in a startup, man. You know, the, the possibility of that thing failing in a couple of years, you know, it's like 50-50. You just don't know. He said, I'm telling you, it's you're in one of the top sports markets in the country. You're going to be seen by a lot of people in Delaware, Jersey, and, and half of Pennsylvania. I really think you should try this. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't want, but of course, my wife convinced me, you know what, let's just go for the interview, see what would happen. And, and lo and behold, once I decided to accept the challenge, Adam, it, that's what I wanted. I wanted to conquer the challenge of being in this market, hardcore sports market, not just fitting in, but separating myself from the masses. Um, I don't want to just be another reporter holding the microphone in front of a player. I don't want to just be a, a reporter telling somebody else's story that you picked up off the wire. Right. I wanted to have my own signature on what this market deserved to know and hear about. And I will say this, and a lot of people who know me, you know, um, there's so many stories that I can never tell about what I've known about the <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles. We all can um, say that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For every 15, for every 15 stories, I cannot tell. Yeah. It was that one story that somebody would give me that I could break. So it was a, it was a nice trade off along the way. We'll, we'll all write a, maybe we'll all collaborate and write a real, real book in about 35, 45 years when uh, most of the bodies no, are buried. No. no, I'm just kidding. I'm hey, kidding. Hey, 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 Jeff, 35, 40 years <laughs> from now, any story that I can tell you, I'd still have to go into witness protection program. Can't I do it, bro. It. Just can't do I it. I know it. I know it. So I'm glad yeah. you, you kind of brought up what brought you here and then what it's like now? Cause you said, yeah. you know, over the last few years, it's so different because I think people are very fascinated by sports media and our jobs. And we're always getting questions yeah. of what it's like. So if you sure. wouldn't mind talking about what it was like when you found out whenever your last day was at CSN, they were laying you off. And also I want to know what you think the last five years, all the changes, not just here, but all the RSNs in, in general, what does that mean for the future of this profession. Right. Mm. Um, like I said a few moments ago, when I found out, you know, uh, there was one part of me that wanted to be angry, bitter. 
But the more they talked and told me that as much as they hated to do this, the economic situation, the COVID-19 situation, it wasn't conducive uh, to keep my salary and, and to keep me in a job where I basically had no role. I mean, we can't, I can't sideline report this year. I have no access to players. There will be no uh, interviews outside the locker room. So what are you going to do with me? And after watching all the cuts over the last four years, I'm smart enough to realize that my time could come in any given moment. You know, um, the last four years, I've hated to see so many good people. Um, and, and not just at our RSNs. If you look across the board, the ESPNs, the Fox Sports, you know, all these networks, NBC, ABC, CBS, they've all gone through it, you know. And you just hope that you can duck, you know, duck the bullet and, and keep moving forward. Um, but so many talented people um, have, have been let go. Um, and, and some of them, you know, that were with our place were only there a couple of years, so they didn't really get to establish themselves uh, in, our, in our market. I look at a talented reporter like a Serena Winters. You know, she's only been here a couple of years, and now she's going to have to look elsewhere for work. Greg Murphy has been an institution here for a long time, you know, so now he's going to be looking elsewhere for work as well. You know, I could mention a hundred names behind the scenes and a lot of them, you know, you would know Jeff, but most people would know in our office that, you know, uh, have, have been shocked by being let go on a whim. Um, it, it's the economy. It's the society we live in now. Uh, for whatever reason, everything is transitioning to digital, you know, and I still don't understand that how everything is being pushed towards digital to an audience which is the millennials don't have money. The money who, that's still spent on advertising is the OGs, as we like to say. Those are the ones that still own the companies that are spending all the dollars uh, on different advertising. And so I don't understand the push, but I see what they're talking about. They're establishing an identity with a generation that's now in their 30s, that's going to be in their 40s and 50s sooner rather than later. And those are the, that's the audience you're going to cater to. But you know, being an OG and, and coming up in the ranks of television the way we used to do it, Adam, you know, old school, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, it's hard to accept the future. Uh, it, it's hard to, to change within. And I did the best that I could in terms of changing what the times to stay relevant with what they were doing. Um, you know, I, I will say this. Um, I'm glad I'm, I'm, at, I'm where I'm at right now in my life because if I had to do it all over again and had the ability to look at what television right is right now, I never would have gotten this business. Mm. No way. Interesting. Mm. Now, I'll tell you, Derek, I was so blown away. Hey, with, with After your announcement came out, yeah. the outpouring of love on Twitter, your picture, yeah. Andy Reid sent you a football, I think, you, you, you posted. Yeah. Yep. I've seen, look, the love that people have for Ray Dinger and, and other broadcasters yeah. uh, growing up here in the Philadelphia area. But I'll have to tell you, it was I was blown away by it. Do you have any idea? I mean, you knew people liked you or loved you. It, it, certainly yeah. lo the fans did. But do you have any idea the outpouring of love that would come out there? No. Um, as you guys might know, it's hard to make me speechless. Um, but, <laughs> but I was speechless. Um, <laughs> when, when, when I released that video two days after um, I found out I was being laid off, I, I, in all honesty, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, maybe a couple, a couple thousand people will view the video. A couple hundred might respond. Um, and, and I'd always thought, I hope I, I've won over the majority of the fan base for what I've done, but you truly don't know, because like I've told a lot of young people trying to get into business, I've preached how just like the music industry, just like the, the acting industry, no matter how nice you are, somebody doesn't like you because of the color of your skin, because of your voice, because of uh, how you present yourself, your style. You can't please everybody. You kill yourself trying to please everybody. So when I released that video, I thought, okay, you know, it is what it is. Uh, as I sit here today, and I, I just some a friend of mine just told me yesterday, he said, you realize that video is two weeks old now, and you've gotten over 930,000 views. And I'm like, what? And then it's over 20,000 views on, Twi uh, on Facebook. And then I started scanning through all the comments uh, on both Facebook and Twitter. Um, and that's when I really knew that, wow, I had made an impact. Um, and I don't toot my own horn. If you know anything about me, I'm as humble as I can possibly be. Um, I don't toot my own horn. I try to let my work speak for itself. But when I saw the outpouring, not of, not, not of affection, not just from a fan base, but Brandon Graham standing up for me, Lane Johnson standing up for me, Brian Dawkins doing a video, my boy DJ Jazzy Jeff giving me a shout out, and Andy Reid, um, and the fans who had just and the, and the comments are still coming in. The phone calls, the text messages from broadcasters, uh, 
fellow journalists, writers. Um, it, it's been it's been phenomenal. Um, you know, I'm not an emotional per person, but that really got to me. And, and I can't thank this entire region enough for embracing me, for trusting me uh, with, with what I tried to present to them. And I'll never forget that. And I'm not speaking as if I'm done in this market, because I think I still have a lot to offer in this market. But I, I'm never going to forget how this entire region embraced me uh, at that particular moment in my life. No doubt about it, Gunnar. We know that you have a lot to offer. Uh, and again, what makes you unique compared to a lot of people on TV is that you can do it all. You've reported, you've hosted, you've analyzed. And I think even some of your analysis can even be out there uh, even more than it was that you can wear that hat. So we're actually going to do that with yeah. you right now. I mean, we want to get to some Eagles yeah. with you uh, and keep that, that flame lit. I I'm curious about, you know, Adam and I, okay. we, we, we talk so much about mm -hmm like individuals and position groups and X's and O's. And, and I want to step back for a second and just get mm -hmm. your take on, this is a different kind of Eagles team than we've seen the last three years as far as where they're at. They seem to be entrenched in some areas and then trying sure. to turn over others. Sure. So what, what do you expect from this team this year? I think it's going to be a very competitive team. Cross your fingers if they can stay healthy, if they can avoid, avoid the landmines of COVID-19. I think it's phenomenal across the board when you think about it that when you're talking about 80 guys in camp, and not just the Eagles, but across the NFL, when you talk about 80 guys in camp, 20 to 30 coaches, training staff, and other essential personnel in close quarters every day, and less than 1% of personnel has contracted COVID, I think they've done a phenomenal job in that regard. Um, when I look at this Eagles team, they have the quarterback in place. I like the young trio of running backs that they have there. I like Boston Scott, Miles. You know, Miles Sanders, I think, is going to be a star in this league. He's on, a, on, on the verge of being a star. I'm, I'm happy they brought Corey Clement back as an insurance policy. I have a huge question mark about the linebacking core, but I like the rotation up front on the defensive line. Um, I like the back end. And I've said since March, and I'll continue to say it, everybody talking about this is Sidney Jones's year. And I've said since March, it's Avante Maddox's job to win or lose. I've had that confirmed a number of times from within the organization. And here's the last time, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with someone within the organization about that particular position. We hope Sidney Jones finally gets it because he does have the talent and because of what he was built to be coming out of college as the elite cornerback coming out and unfortunately had the Achilles injury. He's never lived up to that. But Avante Maddox is the better overall athlete between Sidney Jones and Avante Maddox. And when I'm looking at Avante Maddox, I love this kid. He is not the biggest cornerback out there, but he has no fear of anything. He can bump and run. If he gets beat on the, the out and up move, he has the speed and the quickness to recover and still make a play on the ball. You can move him down to the slot. He doesn't make many mistakes. He's a short tackler for a small guy. He doesn't care how big he is. He's going to lay, lay a helmet on you. And I just love his overall game, and I hope he has an outstanding year this year. I think the wide receiving core is going to be interesting, um, especially with no Alshon Jeffrey there. Uh, basically, you have Deshaun Jackson, cross your fingers, if he can stay healthy. Uh, J.J. Arthur, white side, has to uh, elevate his game, 100 poles and then some. And then you have a bunch of kids, which are, which are big question marks about this team. But I look at the quarterback, and he was throwing the guys walking off the street selling ice cream last year, and he willed that team <laughs> to the playoffs. So if anybody can get it done, it's Carson Wentz with whoever – they put out there with them on the field. All right, so Derek, for someone who's covered this team so closely, I, I yep. really want to ask you this question. Yep. 2016, Doug Peterson becomes the head coach. I want you to be honest with our audience yep. here. Yep. What did you think of that decision? And do you have any idea he'd be this good of a head coach? Uh, number one, I was like, what are the Eagles doing? Um, <laughs> and, Join the club. <laughs> and, and, and number two, uh, no, because if you guys remember – after his first year, going into that second year, which turned out to be the Super Bowl year, there were a lot of people screaming, fire Doug. A lot of people still wanted Doug fired at that point. Yeah, yeah. And this is prior to the 2017 season, man. So I was so happy for Doug because I had known Doug a little bit uh, before he became a head coach. Obviously, he was here as, as an assistant and, of course, out, out there with Andy Reid. So I would known a little bit about Doug before that. I was so elated for him to finally shut up so many people who were not on board with him. And when you look at how he did it in 2017, he lost the franchise quarterback. He lost the future Hall of Fame left tackle. He lost one of the best special team returners in the history of pro football. And you're thinking, this thing's about to disintegrate. And he kept using 
rubber bands and bubble gum and patching it here and patching it there. And lo and behold, <laughs> we all know the end story. So, no, I never thought Doug Peterson would be the type of coach uh, that he is today. But I will say this about Doug Peterson. Every player would run through a brick wall for Doug Peterson because of how he treats them like men. You know, Andy Reid treats his players like men, but Andy Reid's old school. He's a little bit tougher. Doug Peterson knows how to relate to these kids today, and that's saying a lot because when I've talked to a lot of ex-pro uh, football players, not just with the Eagles, but a lot of guys I know, I'm asking, why don't you, why don't you coach, man? You have so much to offer across the board. Man, I don't want to coach these kids today. Man, you, these kids are too sensitive nowadays. Yeah. I don't want to coach yeah. these kids. Yeah. So for Doug to be able to relate to these guys and get the best out of, out of them, kudos to him. All right. I'm curious what you feel. Uh, about the draft. It was a very polarizing draft, particularly yeah. because of, of yeah. no, I, I was going to say because of day two, but even the Rager pick for a lot of people sure. for, because yeah. it wasn't Justin Jefferson and he was on the board. What did right. you think of it? Well, first of all, I know for a fact the Eagles wanted C.D. Lamb and they were shocked that he went at 17 in Dallas. I do know they wanted him. And when they got down to their pick, I'm thinking it's, it's a slam dunk. They're going to take Justin Jefferson, a bigger receiver, just as fast as anybody left on the board. And they take Jalen Rager. And I'm thinking, Wow, you get another smallish type receiver. They already have a whole team full of those. You know, <laughs> you got a, you got a bunch of Smurfs, and you and you drafted another Smurf in the first round. But they're so high on this kid and what he could possibly do. And I will say overall, the fact that they also uh, drafted a few more receivers, running four, four, and four threes beyond that, that tells me they are committed to speed now. I think a lot of teams are trying to emulate what Kansas City did. You know, if there was a team that showed you that speed kills, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. And I think this is what they're trying to do now. But unfortunately, because these kids lost a lot of valuable time, OTAs, minicamp, no preseason games now, their heads are spinning. If I'm Doug Peterson, I limit the package that I have them learn right away just to get them acclimated. So when they hit the ground running that first game, their head's not swimming, and they're running around bumping into each other like the Keystone Cops. But I'm waiting to see what this kid Rager's like. Uh, you know, they're high on him. Obviously, I'm not an evaluator of talent. I know what I like in a receiver. But they picked him number one. Now they have to live with it. And you know what's going to happen, unfortunately, not just in Philadelphia, but across the country. Whatever Jalen Rigger does is going to be compared to CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson. And that's unfortunate. That's not fair to that kid. Or Kenneth Murray. I know the, the, that's another guy that uh, was on their board. But, Derek, I want to go back to, yeah. 20, I want to go back to 2017. You had the bird's eye view of covering this football team. A magical season that, quite frankly – no one saw yeah. coming. You just said a moment ago how cra it didn't look good for Doug after 16. So give us that inside yeah. track. Get, take us, walk us through that season as quickly as you can. A lot of these guys, um, they were committed to turning 2016 around. They didn't want that to happen again. Um, and when they started bringing in guys, the Alshon Jeffries, the Jay Ajayis, the Garrett Blunts, you know, you brought in a presence when you talk about a blunt, you know, who knew what it took to win because of what he did in New England. And so you had the carryovers. You had the guys who were already established in that locker room as leaders. And you coupled the fact that you brought in a few guys who had been in winning situations before. It all came together so quickly. And the one thing I loved about that team that I still love about Doug Peterson teams today is Eagles check at the door. You know how difficult that is in this game. I don't have to tell you guys. You know how difficult it is for football players to check their Eagles at the door and put the common good of the overall product in front of their own money concerns or how many touches? I can honestly say never heard a player grumble throughout 19, uh, 2017 about touches, lack of touches, money. Uh, and, and, you know, and I hear a little bit of everything. And I think that's impressive in itself that these guys were focused. And, and, and his big-time players fell by the wayside. Nobody buckled. Next guy stepped up and just and just just grasped that opportunity and took it and ran with it. Um, and, and, I, and the coaching staff, you know, Deuce Daly is what he is. Deuce is tough on guys, but these guys look up to Deuce as a big brother. You know, um, Frank Wright, very innovative. I don't think Frank Wright gets enough credit for being an innovative offensive mind. You know, and he was a mastermind behind a lot of that offense. And, but him and Doug worked together so well. There was no ego problems between the two. Doug, Doug realized that, you know, I had a formula in terms of how I want to run offense, but here's a guy who's been doing it longer than I have, and they combined the two minds, and it worked perfectly. It seemed like everything they came up with offensively or defensively worked like a charm. I mean, you don't win, what, 13 games in a season in the NFL by accident, especially when you're losing the volume of players that they lost. 
Um, so I, th I just thought it was impressive that nobody veered off the course of what they started out talking about prior to their season. And my goodness, I don't think anybody, if anybody tells you they thought after what we watched from week one to week 16 that this was a Super Bowl contender, I'll call you flat out liar to your face because nobody <laughs> saw that coming. I mean, I could tell you, Derek, from talking to the team before the season, I said some, someone to their front office, they asked me, what do you think? And I go, I, I think nine and seven is reasonable. And the guy exactly. said, I'll take that. And I've reminded that guy over the years, I, I, you know, if I ever see this guy, I'll say, hey, by the way, I was right that you guys would have a winning record. He goes, yeah, but you didn't think we'd be that good. I'm like, yeah, of course not. Who the hell would know? <laughs> you're right. You're right. I mean, it's unbelievable. It but, you know, sure thank goodness. I mean, this city deserved it. Yeah, this city deserved it, man. These people got tired of, of hearing about 12 uh, Super Bowl championships within the NFC East and the Eagles have a goose egg. Um, I, yeah, I can't tell you how many people I met along the way. Degon, I don't care if if we if we don't have, if we have five or six trophies. I want to live to see one. That's right. And I'm like, wow, that, that's a powerful statement. I want to live to see something that my mm. my parents may not have, my grandparents never got to see. But it's one trophy in my lifetime. So I mean, that that was that was a special moment. I've covered a lot of Super Bowls like you guys have. That by far was my my best Super Bowl ever to cover. Mm. Gunner, you're the, you're the consummate pro, man. Thank you so much for going on. Um, as I reflect on working with you for three years, the one thing that always stands out to me, yeah. coming from a newspaper, being a beat writer, is that for the first time in my life, yeah. working with guys like you and Leslie and, and everybody there, Amy Fadul, the producers, you know, Sean yeah. and Kessner and Slotkin, is that for the first time, I wasn't working for the toy department. You know, when you're at a newspaper – all the other sections yeah. look at you yep. sports as the sports writers like we don't have real jobs and we're just all in it for the fun but then when you sure. get to the environment sure. where we were at you realize that everybody is having fun but they are working so i've never worked as hard in my life but loved how hard everybody yeah. was devoted to their yeah. craft and yeah. you were a big part of that man i really really appreciate everything you did for me in my career all the insight you gave me and uh, i hope that you yeah. can be a, you know, come Thank on you, inside the birds and join us again in the future and, and do some work with us. Yeah. You know, I have the utmost respect for you and Adam. Uh, I always have, I always will. And, and you know what? I, I think the thing that's most unique about this Philadelphia market that whether it's TV, radio, or newspaper, everybody got along. You don't see that in New York, Chicago. There was always this fine line that newspaper guys didn't like TV guys, and right. TV guys didn't like uh -huh. radio guys, and radio guys didn't like newspaper guys. Everybody in this market meshed, man. We would talk at practices, as you know. We'd take sh verbal shots at each other. We would mingle on road trips, you know, and talk, and, and sometimes share information. And I think that was an in incredible uniqueness about this Philadelphia market that you just don't see another top 10, top 20 market. No, go travel in the country, Derek. It's funny you say that when I go to training camps, th there, there's a lot of animosity yep. amongst the NFL yep. reporters, especially local beat writers. But in Philly, it ha yep. Jeff knows this as being a beat reporter, and you, you know, you're there all the time. It did surprise me growing up in this business, really starting in 1999, how much guys got along. Now, yep. I don't know what people said behind their backs. I can't speak to that. But you could just tell. People are generally nice right. to each other, and it's not like that, Jeff. You know that as you yes. travel and be from yeah. the New York no. energy area. It's not always I'm like that. I'm laughing because there, there are a few no notable incidents that have happened among the I writers themselves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but in general, yeah, I think you're yeah. right. I mean, but, but those are isolated. <laughs> yeah, those, those were isolated incidents oh, oh, for the most oh, part. You, you know, exactly. Uh, and, exactly. It happens. And you know those incidents, it happens. as it turned out, they were, they were quite funny. I mean, they were, they were serious at the moment. Well, well by the way, hey, Derek, the one, you're, the one you're talking about, uh, we don't need to get into what it was, but it was Eagles related. And yeah. someone yep. someone from the Eagles front office wanted to know if I was there and did I get a tape of it. And I, I go, no, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I was reading it on Twitter. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Why was I not yeah. there that day? Uh, we want to yeah. make fun of anyone, but – that's that. That's a typical story that happens. The the, the, uh, the I guess you could say the tempers boil over, Jeff. But I, I would say this about you, Derek. Um, I didn't know you yeah. at all until we, until really I started covering the team. I don't know of a more respected journalist in our in our market. It's really remarkable. Um, I was just again, as I said there earlier, I was so humbled for you. Thank you. With, with the with the outpouring of love, I was like, my God, this is is yeah. this incredible? You're not even from here. I mean, as you said, you did. 
you you came in here in 1997. Uh, that's a credit to you, and I'm uh, I'm, I'm so glad yeah. that uh, everything's working out. Thank you, man. You know, when you think about what we do for our livelihood, we get to sit and talk sports. <laughs> we get to give our opinions whether people agree with them or not, and we get paid for it. You know how many men and women would cut off an arm just to have the <laughs> opportunity to to sit next to athletes, to chat mm -hmm. with athletes and coaches, to say that you've been able to go in every stadium in the NFL in your career? Yeah. I mean, that's a blessing, man. No matter what happens to me from this moment forward, I've been blessed for four decades to do what I, I do. And I, I, if I had a chance uh, to do it all over again, just to cover football, yes. But as I said before, the way the industry has gone, I don't know. I, I, I don't like what I'm seeing in the industry yeah. now. Well, uh, we hope that you are still a big part of it, Derek. We, we really appreciate you uh, coming Thank on you. again. Uh, remember, everybody, go to statesidevodka.com. Get 10% off the best vodka out there. They're from Philly. Use the promo code BIRDS on pickup or delivery because they deliver to Philadelphia. You don't get Chester. a free case? You're not a free case? What? I'll send you one. We'll get you one. Well, you're not, in the, first, you're not in the county. You're not in the right county. You what? moved all what? the way to the sticks. You're right. We're just good old country folk down here. That's right. Uh, but they do deliver to Philadelphia, Chester, Delaware, Montgomery, Bucks, Westmoreland, and Allegheny counties. That's going to do it for this edition of Inside the Birds TV. Thanks to our producer, Hunter Brody. Find his work on uh, YouTube, Sports Talk with Broads. Catch the latest Inside the Birds podcast. It's going to drop Thursday morning, and uh, it's on any platform that you use. And also check out InsideTheBirds.com for our latest Eagles coverage. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Derek. And thanks to all the viewers for watching the latest episode of ITV TV.